Good morning, friends. My name is Todd. I'm from Spring Valley. The church that I'm part of is in Stuartville. I'm here today because I am a regional missionary in southeast Minnesota and northeast Iowa. I am about the gospel. I am not going to quibble. I'm here because I want to see you converted. I want to see you serving and loving Jesus Christ. In the early days of the church, shortly after Christ descended into heaven, the apostles and the other early Christians devoted themselves to preaching the gospel in public in the open air. This was not an uncommon thing. It was cultural. Many people at that time, different cultures, gathered to share their views, share their religious beliefs, their philosophical beliefs, and to debate them in public. It has fallen by the wayside in the modern American church. For some reason, Christians today are content to say that they are Christian and to not share their faith with anyone else, let alone in public. I would like to see that change, but more importantly, I would like to see souls saved. Paul, probably the most prolific of all the Christian apostles, especially when you look at how much of the New Testament he wrote, engaged in this kind of ministry throughout his entire life. So much so that it led to his persecution and his eventual martyrdom. He was beheaded as a Roman citizen in Rome for the preaching of the gospel. And not not just for telling people about his faith, but for actually preaching the gospel and declaring that Jesus Christ was the one and only God. This was a, a criminal act in, in Roman government, in Roman society. In one of his public addresses, Paul was in Athens, and he went to the Areopagus, which is a place where philosophers would gather, and this is what he said to them in Romans 17, starting in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on, all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their, their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius and an Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with him. This man, that Paul was talking about that was appointed to someday come and judge the world was the man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. You see, the Romans were a pantheistic religion or people. Their religion was made up of hundreds of gods and demigods. And even in covering all of that, in the Roman and Greek culture, they knew they, had, they were missing something, which is why they had built an altar that said to the unknown God. What made Paul unique to them was the fact that Paul said he knew who that God was. 
Paul said that he could identify that God to them. And not only that, not only could he identify that God to them, he would also go on to tell them that it was the only true God, and that all the gods that the people in Athens and the people in the Roman Empire served were false gods. Images that they created with their own hands out of silver and wood and precious stone and gold. Gods that had eyes made out of diamonds or rubies. Gods that had hands that were carved from wood, even valuable wood. They were still idols. Now how different are we from the Romans today or, or the Greek culture of the day? In some senses, we don't have any gar craven Im images. In many ways, we don't find ourselves worshiping at altars that are dedicated to false gods. But every single one of us is guilty of idolatry in our hearts. There is always something in our hearts that we love more than we love God. And if you think that isn't true, then consider for a moment how you woke up this morning. Was the praise of God the first thing on your lips? Did you thank God for the breath that He gave you as you woke up this morning? Did you thank Him for the fact that while you slept, He kept your heart beating? If you're like me, it probably wasn't the first thing on your mind. And I say that as a person who professes to be a Christian. I say that as a person whose life has been radically changed and altered by the God who saved him. But the most important thing for us to remember is not that we have made idols in our own minds, created gods or things that we consider more valuable or important than the God of creation. The most important thing for us to remember is, is that God has condemned that. So it would be one thing if we had idols in our lives. It would be one thing if we worshipped something besides God in our hearts if it wasn't for the fact that God said, you shall have no other gods before you. You shall not commit idolatry. You should remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. But the reality is, is that God despises those things. God hates the fact that most of us worship something besides Him. And see, God has a right to hate that. We don't hear people talk in our society today much about the hatred of God because it's uncomfortable. And because the reality is, is God is also love. But He's also holy. The prophet Isaiah, writing in chapter 6 of his, of his works, talks about the vision that he had where he was taken up to heaven and he was given a glimpse of the throne room of God and, and what he reports about the angels as they gathered around the throne of God was that they were singing and chanting holy, holy, holy we forget that about God he's holy or we'll say things like holy smoke or holy cow or other uh, not so pleasant ways of using the word holy God's holiness describes who He is and all of His other attributes fall underneath the umbrella under the, the guidance of His holiness. So yes, God is holy. And because of His holiness, He must be just. He must have wrath against sin. But He's also loving. He's merciful and He's gracious. And His holiness drives those things. And in His holiness, He has commanded us to obey Him, to follow the commandments, His high, eternal, moral law. The Ten Commandments weren't just these things written on tablets of stone given to, to Moses. They are part and parcel of who God is. So when God says, have no other gods before me, what He's saying is, is don't, don't worship other people because I don't worship anything don't love anything more than you love me. Yet, we spend our all, all of our lives in sin. Born in sin and sinning. 
none of us loves God the way we should. None of us obeys, obeyed our parents the way that we should. All of us have lied. All of us in some way, shape, or form have stolen something from someone at some time. We're all guilty of adultery, at least in the heart, if not in reality. Every single person alive within the sound of my voice today has looked with lust on someone that they are not married to, and God condemns that and calls it adultery, even if you don't act on it. God says, Thou shalt not murder. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, declares, You have heard it said days, in days of old, Thou shalt not commit murder. But I tell you, if you hate someone, you are guilty of murder already in your heart. That's a really heavy burden. It's impossible for us to bear. But God, in His love, and in His holiness, in His mercy, in His grace, and because of His holy wrath and anger towards sin and sinners, did something none of us could imagine doing on our own. He sent Christ a little over 2,000 years ago to come and live, not just as a man, but as the God-man, God in the flesh, second person of the Trinity, completely without sin. 33 years he lived, keeping all of God's moral law perfectly, without fail, day after day after day after day, second by second, moment by moment. Jesus Christ did what you can't do for five minutes. Obeyed God the Father perfectly. And at the end of his life, having lived in that active obedience, he went to the cross passively, not, pro not proclaiming his innocence, not declaring that it was unfair that he die. We can't, we can't even declare something unfair at all, yet we spend all of our time talking about how unfair it is when somebody else gets a promotion that we think we deserve or gets the pay raise that we want. Sometimes we think it's unfair when our favorite football teams don't make it to the playoffs or can't catch a, catch a break from the referees. Yet God did not, God the Son, Jesus Christ, did not declare how unfair it was that he was hung on a cross after being beaten mercilessly by Roman guards. And as he hung there on that cross, he suffered not just physical pain. Millions of people suffered physical pain on Roman crosses. What Jesus did on the cross was suffer the just condemnation that we deserve. He suffered the wrath of the Father on the cross. See, without the wrath of God, that, that thing, that attribute that's reserved for unrepentant sinners in hell, being poured out on Christ, without that, the cross would mean nothing. Jesus would have been just another man hung for rebellion and treason. But no, instead he suffered the wrath of the Father on the cross. And what he suffered in a few short hours is an eternity worth of hell. It's an eternity's worth of having the anger of God against sin poured out on you. He instead took on himself 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 reads, and I'm going to paraphrase this, He, God the Father, made Him, God the Son, to become sin on our part so that we could become the very righteousness of God through Christ. Do you understand, my friends, what that means? Having done nothing to deserve the wrath of God, Jesus Christ went and absorbed it and took it, not just, not just in, a, in a figurative way, but in a real and actual way. Christ took the sin of those who would repent and believe the gospel message. He took it on Himself. He absorbed the complete wrath of God for repentant sinners in His own body. He suffered what we deserve. And if you would but repent, turn from your sin, confess your wickedness to God, you can know that Christ paid for that. And God will take off of you your sin and He will place it on Christ as He did on the cross and then He will give you the righteousness of Christ. You don't deserve that. 
You deserve to be punished. You deserve to suffer under the wrath of God for eternity. But he loved the world enough to send his son to die in our place. Don't you understand? As foreign as this message may sound to you, as strange as I may seem standing here and saying these things to you, Christ did and took what you deserve. You deserve what Christ took. You don't deserve His righteousness. You don't deserve the good things that, that you get every day, let alone the righteousness of Christ. And as I read in Acts 17, now God commands everyone everywhere to repent. Repentance is that recognizing your sin and being appalled by it and turning away from it, despising the wretchedness that it is and loving God above all else, trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation, placing your faith and trust in Him, turning to Him and living. He doesn't promise an easy life. But His death, His burial, and His resurrection promises us forgiveness. And that is the best thing that you can reserve, you can cert receive on this side of eternity is that promise of everlasting life in the presence of God the Father forever and ever. So if you're hearing this message and, it, and maybe, maybe it's making you angry or maybe you're just laughing at me but maybe somewhere in the dark recesses of your mind you're being pricked. Maybe it's not right now. Maybe it'll be later today or a few days from now. Or maybe you've heard this message from me or from others before me. Let it rest on you. Don't, don't, don't think you have eternity. Don't think that you have 20, 30, 40 more years to make it right with God. Say to yourself, instead, my life could be called to account today. Don't say to yourself, I've got the rest of my life, because you don't know how long that is. So I plead with you in love, as strange as that may sound to most of you, I plead with you in Christ-like love, in Christian love, turn away from your sin. Look to Christ on the cross. Receive His forgiveness. Repent of your sins. Turn to Christ and live. Well, today is still today.